Our, uh, our next presenter is Craig Benson from the University of Missouri. Wanted to get it off the table right away. Um, I'm going to get a, a little bit different flavor here and tell you a little bit of a story. Um, and this story, I hope, can apply to you whether you teach or parent or manage other people. But you'll see where it goes. And I want you to think about 1995. What were you doing? What was going on? <laughs> here are some images that might remind you. Remember that the, this year's freshman class would have been two years old in 1995. Two years old. That is the same age. Uh, as my two-year-old son, Riley. So this is him, two years old. That's what, how old they were. I was in college, and I was an electrical engineering major at the time. And I was about ready to make a huge major decision in my life. I decided to change my major. I was really interested in how people uh, manage other folks, so I decided to change into management. <laughs> On August 22nd, 1995, I took my first management class. And in that class, we did a number of different things. Uh, but one of them was we started talking about what were the major activities that you do in management. And they look like this. Um, so we go through these five. And really, I was interested in people management, not thing management. So unfortunately, it took a little bit of time for us to get to a place where we started talking about that. Actually, it wasn't until about November that we got down to the bottom two there, leading and controlling. And those are the two that they thought were talking about people management. And they were really, really focused on the idea of punishment and reward, this kind of extrinsic motivation. Um, I, I, I felt like something was missing, but I couldn't put my finger on what it was. Fast forward several years. I moved to the University of Missouri, start managing about 25 people. Um, I, I was doing a good job, not a great job. Uh, and they were student employees. My worst fear at that time was that someone would come through and catch my student employees not working at some point. And somewhere along the line, I had this idea that something was missing from this model. Uh, something was missing. And it was really based on one major assumption that I was making and that I was taught in the way that I was taught management. Now, one major assumption that was wrong was that people don't want to work. If people don't want to work, people don't want to do a good job. If people don't want to do a good job, then it's up to the manager to provide the punishment and reward to incentivize them to produce quality and success. I don't believe in that. In 1949, a man by the name of Harry Harlow did an experiment with eight rhesus monkeys. He decided he wanted to see if he could provide them with an incentive to solve a simple puzzle. So he puts these simple puzzles into the cage with these monkeys. He's going to test them in two weeks. He wanted them to get acclimated to those puzzles. Didn't teach them how to use the puzzles. Didn't give them any kind of food or anything. Lo and behold, with a lot of joy and focus and determination, these monkeys started solving the puzzles long before the two weeks ever came up. So by the time that they got to the end and they started giving the monkeys raisins, because monkeys like raisins, apparently, um, they actually did worse with the puzzles when they got raisins for it than when they were just doing it for fun. There was something about the joy of the task being its own reward that was interesting. 1949, that was 46 years before I took that management class, we knew about intrinsic motivation. We knew about intrinsic motivation. Um, this has been advanced now. If you know anything about self-determination theory, there's a lot of great information out there. Uh, my recommendation would be to read a book by Daniel Pink uh, called Drive, based off of this. These are three components of what we know to be important in intrinsic motivation, uh, what things people really want out of that kind of environment. So autonomy, mastery, and purpose. But really, in the end, when I look at management now, I see it as a self-fulfilling prophecy. That if you believe that your employees want to do a good job, you will do things that will help them find their own intrinsic motivation, and they will be successful. If you think that they don't want to do a good job, you will do things that make them not want to do a good job. You will micromanage. You will control them. You will do a lot of things that really take all of the potential that they have away from them. Um, so now I supervise well over 50 students. Um, I take a different approach to it. I'm no longer worried about whether or not somebody's going to find them not working at some point. My biggest fear at this point is that by the time that they graduate, that those students won't have reached their full potential. Big difference, big difference. And it makes a huge difference in their lives. And one of the things that has gotten me to this point is the use of Quest. It helps me to identify 
help than me to, to look at people in a different way, look at their talents, look at what things motivate them, look at things, ways that I can help them grow and develop and ways that I can give them good feedback that's constructive. Um, it's really helped me to look at life a different way and management a different way. Uh, and so I want to end with a quote by Peter Drucker, a great management theorist, focus on the bottom part, where it says, the man who always knows what people cannot do but never sees what, people, what they can do will undermine the spirit of the organization. Gender is wrong, but the thought is brilliant. Thank you. <laughs>